Let me invite you to sit down. I want to speak for just a moment on uh, the five solas of the Reformation. So when you think of the Reformation, what comes to mind? Is it faraway people in faraway places uh, engaged in faraway matters of thought and doctrine or the like with perhaps little connection to your day, your life, this place? Is that what comes to mind? If so, I want to offer a simple way to think of the Reformation, that you would think of it as a rescue operation. More specifically, God's rescue mission, wherein he rescued the word of God from darkness and obscurity. And he used it to set the gospel of God before a little-known Augustinian monk who was transformed by the Spirit of God as he read from a Bible chained to a post and encountered the truth of the gospel for the very first time. It was a rescue mission. And through this one man, God began to change the world and reawaken a hunger to hear God speak. And we are direct descendants of that reform movement, of that rescue mission. And we continue in it as we look to the word as the final decisive authority for all of life and faith, and as we desire to allow the word of God to be continually reforming our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That's at the heart of the Reformation. It represents a move to place God as he has revealed himself in Christ at the center of the church's life and thought. And at the foundation of this reform movement were five core principles, the theses, if you will, of the Reformation, known as the five solas. And there they are. Soli Deo Gloria, Solos Christos, Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Solo Gratia. Let me begin with the foundational principle of Sola Scriptura. I just want to, to fill this out and expand this briefly in our time this evening. When the Reformers used the word Sola Scriptura, they were expressing their concern for the Bible as, as authoritative and what it meant is that the Bible alone is our ultimate authority, not the Pope, not the church, not the traditions of the church or church councils even, but scripture alone. Other sources of authority may have an important role to play. Some are even established by God's uh, rule and word, such as the authority of elders over the church or maybe the authority of the state, or the authority of parents over children. But scripture alone is to be the ultimate authority. This was the driving principle of the Reformation. If any of these other authorities depart from Bible teaching, then they are to be judged by God's word. And where they are not consonant with it, reject it. Sola Scriptura. Secondly is Solos Christos, Christ alone. The church of the Middle Ages spoke about Christ, uh, but the medieval church had added many achievements, human achievements, to Christ's work. And this core principle was a distilling, again, to what was uh, alone of greatest import, the work of Christ. And And what had happened in in this day was to such a degree that that the work of Christ was no longer possible to say that salvation was entirely by Christ and his work on the cross, his atonement, but rather incorporated man's effort. And so the Reformation motto of Solus Christus was formed to repudiate this error. It affirmed that salvation had been accomplished once for all by the mediatorial work of Christ, Christ, 
alone. His sinless life, substitutionary death and atonement for the justification of sinners. And any gospel that failed to acknowledge that or denies it is a false gospel. Christ alone. How do you apprehend this Christ? This is what comes next. Solo gratia, by grace alone. Through faith alone, solo fide. Grace alone, the words solo gratia mean that God saves sinner by grace alone. This is his ultimate means. If, if he does save sinners this way, which is in fact the case, then it is for his purposes and his pleasure. Apart from this grace and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that flows from it, no one would be saved. Since in our lost condition, human beings are not capable of winning, seeking out, or even cooperating with God's grace. By insisting on grace alone, the reformers were denying human methods, techniques, or strategies in themselves that they could ever bring anyone to faith. It was only by grace alone expressed through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that brings us to Christ, releasing us from our bondage to sin and raising us from death to spiritual life. Paul said it this way, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. But grace alone, the ultimate means, but through an intermediate means of faith. And so solo fide. The reformers never tired of saying that justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. When put into theological shorthand, as we've been discussing through our series in Galatians. uh, It is justification by faith alone. That is the core idea. It was the article by which the church stands or falls according to Luther. And the reformers called justification by faith the material principle of Christianity. That is, it is the very matter or substance of what a person must understand in order to be saved. Justification is a declaration of God based on the work of Christ, and it flows from God's grace, and it comes to the individual not by anything he or she might do, but only by faith. So we may state the full doctrine this way. Justification is the act of God by which he declares sinners to be righteous because of Christ alone, by his grace alone, through faith alone. And lastly then, soli deo gloria. To God alone be the gloria. Each be the glory. Each of these great solos is summed up in this Reformation motto. It is what Paul expressed in Romans eleven thirty six when he said to him, be glory forever and ever, amen. These words follow naturally from the preceding words. And far from him and through him and to him are all things, since it is because all things really are from God and all things exist for his glory and especially the salvation of sinners. These were the core principles of the Reformation. They were intended to... Uh, to recalibrate the church and to give, to give every opportunity then for the gospel of grace to spread out broadly and widely and deeply through the church, through this part of Europe and beyond such that even today we are its descendants and we partake of its fruit because it was a clear movement to set forth the gospel again so that people could hear and believe. I'm calling uh, tonight's talk Rescuing Repentance Through Reformation.
And uh, it occurred to me, I'm not actually going to do an exposition of Scripture. And, uh, of course, this was around 345 when this occurred to me, and I thought to myself, you know, at the heart of the Reformation was expositions of Scripture. And this is what it was that God used to bring about the radical transformation we saw, uh, we see throughout history in Europe and then spreading out from beyond there. But, um, but we are going to start with Scripture, and then, and then I'm going to give sort of part um, historical background, a little history, hopefully interesting history for you, and then the other part is um, more practical, where the rubber meets the road and what difference and what's the role of repentance in the life of a believer today. So that's where we're going. I'm going to start with Luke chapter 5, though, verses 27 through 32, if you have your Bible. Again, I won't be exposing this, but it sort of sets the background, the backdrop for the talk tonight. Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. We read there, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is God's Word. And this is what Jesus is still doing today. Let me just offer a prayer as we begin. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity tonight to pause and to reflect on your faithfulness through the ages. Thank you for Pastor Todd's sharing of the solas and just reminding us of these fundamental core principles that today seems hard to imagine that these could possibly be lost, and yet they were for many years. And so we thank you. Lord, for the grounding that you've given us in your word, and that today we can come and read the word, not chained to a post somewhere, but in our homes and on our phones and everywhere we go, Lord, we can find the word if we hunger and thirst enough to look at it and to read it and to consider what it says. So tonight we ask that you'd teach us and help us. May this time be profitable for each one tonight, and may our love for you deepen and grow even as we consider this truth about repentance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A few years ago, you may have heard of this, since a number of our folks are from St. Louis, but uh, a few years ago, a Lutheran group in St. Louis rented the Roman Catholic Cathedral for a meeting. And uh, the priest greeted them, the group, with this comment, we're pleased to provide the cathedral for your use. Please don't nail anything to the doors this time. The crowd thought that was pretty good. Well, tonight as we reflect on 500 years of the Reformation, or more precisely 500 years since Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the castle door in Wittenberg, uh, the castle church door, I want to draw your attention to the very first of those 95 theses. And if any of you know any of the 95 theses, probably the one you know is the first one. And this is what it says. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent... He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. In other words, the very first point that Martin Luther wanted, uh, was making in what would become the ignition spark that caused the Reformation to explode throughout Europe was a point about repentance and its place in the life of a believer. Many Christians today don't know much about repentance, don't know much about the important role it plays in our lives, and probably many of us see repentance as something that we hope to avoid, generally. It's generally a, a, negatively, a negative word. But if we understand the gospel, the gospel as recovered in the Reformation, repentance becomes a beautiful thing, and actually we understand it to be a gift that God gives to us. In order to understand the beauty of repentance, however, you have to understand the context from which this doctrine was rescued in those days. Now, in Luther's day, the Roman Catholic Church was in the business of selling something I'm sure you've heard of by now called indulgences. What is an indulgence? An indulgence was a piece of paper, a certificate, which guaranteed the purchaser, 
or the person for whom it was purchased, full or partial remission of the temporal consequences of sin. So, it was full or partial remission of the temporal consequences of sin. I'll get into this a little bit more. But one of the temporal consequences of sin in in Roman Catholic theology uh, was the doctrine of purgatory. And the basic idea behind purgatory is that most people at death are too good to go to hell, but not good enough to go straight to heaven. And so, in the fires of purgatory, their sins are purged from them, and they're made fit for heaven. Now, of course, you know this Bible is not taught in the Scriptures, and so, uh, nevertheless, it was commonplace in the day, and it's still commonplace, of course, today. But when a person purchased an indulgent, an indulgence, it usually meant that a certain amount of time in purgatory would be removed as a result of this financial transaction. An indulgence was something you paid money for, you got it, and then a certain amount of your temporal punishment for sin was taken away. Now, there were two fundamental beliefs that drove this practice of granting indulgences in Luther's day. First, the Roman Catholics believed that with every sin, there was the guilt of sin, and there was also the temporal punishment that was due for that sin. So, two aspects to every sin. Through confession, the guilt of your sin could be forgiven but you would still have to pay the temporal punishment for offending God. This was called penance. The second thing this rested on, this practice of selling indulgence, was the belief in purgatory that I've already referred to. And here's how it worked. If you wanted to spend less time in purgatory after you died, or even no time in purgatory after you died, you had a couple of options. You could do good works, like going on a pilgrimage, giving alms to the poor, other things like that, building a cathedral and so on. Or you could buy an indulgence. Additionally, if you had loved ones who were suffering in purgatory, you could buy indulgences on their behalf and spring them out of purgatory or at least lessen the amount of time that they might potentially spend there. Now, to be clear, this has often been misunderstood by us Protestants, Indulgences were not a forgiveness of the guilt of sin, but only a canceling of the temporal consequences of sin. So, whenever, you know, if you're having a conversation with a Roman Catholic friend and they disagreeing with you on your understanding of indulgences, that, that idea, it's not, they don't understand indulgences, and I'm, not, I'm just ta- I'm talking about the, this doctrine is practiced in the 16th century. I don't even know where it stands today, but... Um, they're talking indulgences, we're talking about canceling the temporal consequences of sin. Um, Erwin Lutzer in a book on the Reformation writes this, he says, the theologians made a distinction between the penalty due to sin, which required an indulgence, and the guilt of sin, which only God could forgive. The common person, however, saw no distinction between these two things and then ended up viewing the indulgence as a ticket to heaven. So that's where the breakdown happened. In their theology, there was a difference between guilt and then the punishment for the thing. And when they sold an indulgence, it was only to deal with the temporal punishment. But the common person understood, I pay money, my guilt and everything else goes away. Although the church wasn't teaching you could purchase your salvation for you or anyone else, of course, over the course of time, the average lay person seemed to be associating forgiveness of sins with the payment of money. And and actually, something very similar happens in the time of the first century, and um, what we call Second Temple Judaism, where they uh, develop a um, a legalistic understanding of Scripture in the Old Testament. Let me stay on point here. All right, much more could be said about the Roman Catholic Church and and the and the penitential system as it was understood in Luther's day. Uh, But I don't want to focus there in part because, as I've already said, I don't understand the system well enough to uh, myself, and I don't want to misrepresent their teaching. Suffice it to say, this was the basic view about indulgences in the time of Luther. So why does Martin Luther pound these 95 theses to the door? Well, here's what happened. Pope Leo needed money to complete an enormous building project called St. Peter's Basilica. Perhaps you've heard of it. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's one of the most stunning buildings, of course, in all the world. It also happens to be one of the most expensive ever built. The old basilica 
which dated back to Constantine in 319, had been condemned. And so Pope Julius II began a new basilica, but the project was still unfinished. And so he happened to be short of cash to finish with the construction. And it was at this time that a solution came forward for how to get the money in order to build and finish out St. Peter's Basilica. So onto the scene comes Albert of Brandenburg. Albert aspired to become the Archbishop of Mainz. He already held two bishoprics, even though, from what I understand, he was not actually old enough to have even one. Uh, But he didn't want just two. He wanted a third. Unfortunately, it was also not legal to have a third. Fortunately for him, he did have money. Unfortunately for him, buying his third position was going to be exceptionally expensive. So he haggled with the Pope, who was willing to sell him the position. Ultimately, they came to a deal for 10,000 ducats or 10,000 gold coins. Albert had money, but he didn't have that much money. That was a lot. So somehow he had to come up with it. Before he could take office, he had to pay the entire 10,000 gold coins to the Pope up front. And so he goes to a bank in Germany and gets himself a loan. A deal was struck whereby the bank would advance the money to pay what Albert owed the Pope, and the Pope would then give Albert the authorization to sell indulgences for the church. Yes, the Pope would authorize a man to sell people the ability to lessen their punishment for sin so that he could pay off the debt he owed for buying a position of power in the church. If this is your first introduction to church history, you should know it actually gets worse than this. (laughs) There are good stories too, but... There's a lot of worse ones than this. Anyway, the proceeds from the sale of indulgences, so he pays the 10,000 up front, and then all of the proceeds from the sale of the indulgences, a portion goes back to the bank loan he owes to the bank in Germany. The other portion goes to the Pope after having already paid him the 10,000 gold coins up front, which assured a continuous income stream from Albert's ongoing sale of indulgences. In other words, the Pope set himself up with a healthy passive income. He didn't need to do anything. The income rolls in. That's a good financial management strategy, right? All right. Well, now Albert was shrewd if he wasn't particularly righteous, and his particular brand of indulgences were calculated to get the very most amount of money out of the peasants that he could. Many of our modern televangelists could learn a thing or two from this guy. This is how he operated. Those who paid the prescribed amount were promised a full and perfect remission of all sins and even a return to the state of innocence, exempting them entirely from the fires of purgatory. Even more, if they paid the right price, they could get their dead relatives or friends out of purgatory and directly into heaven. So you can see why this would distress someone like Luther, who actually was discovering what the Bible said and yet what was being practiced by the church in his day. Well, among the numerous vendors of these indulgences was an extremely dedicated salesman, a Dominican friar by the name of Johann Tetzel. He must have been to numerous Zig Ziglar and Tony Robbins seminars because this guy could sell. Tetzel would enter town with the cross bearing the papal arms and with the Pope's promise of indulgence carried on this gold-embroidered cushion. And he would plant a cross in the town square, and he would begin his sermon like this. And listen to this message. He would say, Consider the salvation of your souls and those of your departed loved ones. Visit the holy cross erected before you. This is where it gets good. Listen to the voices of your dear dead relatives and friends, beseeching you and saying, Pity us, pity us. We are in dire torment from which you can redeem us for a pittance. Do you not wish to? Open your ears. Hear the father saying to his son, the mother saying to her daughter, we bore you, we nourished you, we brought you up, we left you our fortunes, and you are so cruel and hard now that you are not willing for so little to set us free. Will you let us lie here in the flames? Will you delay our promised glory? Guilt much? 
And then followed a little jingle that has become famous. It went like this. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. Well, people from Luther's town of Wittenberg had crossed the river to purchase these indulgences, some of them buying indulgences for sins they hadn't even committed yet but were fully intending to. So you can imagine being a a, a pastor, a shepherd of people and watching this happen and reading the word and seeing what's going on and saying, enough is enough. Well, it was the last straw for the 33-year-old Luther. So on October 31st, 1517, 500 years Tuesday, he walked to the Wittenberg Castle Church and he nailed his 95 theses to the door. And by the way, the church and the door are still there. A number of us got to visit it a few years ago and you can still see it today. The door functioned essentially like a bulletin board, and Luther didn't think the average person would be interested in this. He was hoping to promote a scholar's debate. He didn't even write in the language of the people. He wrote in Latin because he didn't intend for the general public to even be aware of the conversation. But somebody translated it into German, and it struck a chord with the people. Furthermore, when Luther posted this, he had no intention of breaking from the Roman Catholic Church. He certainly had no idea that his actions would eventually change the map of Europe or that we would be remembering his actions some 500 years later with celebration. In fact, Luther wasn't even opposed to the idea of indulgences per se. He simply wanted to correct what he saw as abuses. So he posted his 95 theses as a conversation starter, and as I said earlier, his first thesis was this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. And so that's what we'll talk about for the rest of our time here, the second half. The Roman Catholic penitential system as it existed in Luther's day fell short of a biblical view of repentance, but many of us have notions of repentance that are much more like the Roman Catholic penitential system than what the Bible actually teaches. So, to lead us in the conversation tonight, I'm going to borrow heavily from two different sources. And the first is a short essay by Tim Keller called All of Life is Repentance. And the second is a chapter from a book that Pastor Todd is working through with folks on Sunday mornings called Gospel-Centered Life on the topic of repentance. Now, When Luther says that all of life is repentance, it seems like he's saying that Christians will never make much progress in the Christian life and we're simply going to be failing all the time. Well, that, of course, wasn't Luther's point at all. He isn't talking about a life of just constant groveling and misery and and, and so on. That's not what he meant by a life of repentance. What Luther was saying is that repentance is the way we make progress in the Christian life. The Christian life is really a two-step. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. And in fact, those, that two-step is actually two sides of one coin. To turn away from sin is to turn to Christ, to repent and to believe. We continually turn away from the alternatives to trusting in Christ. Sin is always an alternative to trusting Him. So we're constantly repenting, turning away from the alternatives to trusting in Christ, and we're turning back to the one true Savior. We're pulling our affections away from our false saviors that we are constantly looking to, and we're setting our affections once again on the true Savior, Jesus Christ. But for most of us, the word repentance has a negative connotation. We only repent typically when we do something really bad, and we all have our own definitions of what's really bad and what really requires repentance and what doesn't. The Roman Catholic idea of penance often bleeds into our thinking about repentance. And so here's how we operate. When we sin, we believe we should feel sorry about it. We should probably spend a few days beating ourselves up over it. And we should do something to make it up to God. In other words, repentance often becomes more about us than it is about God or the people that we've sinned against. We want to feel better. We want things to be back to normal. We want to know that we've done our part so that our guilt is assuaged and we can move on with life. Repentance is not something that we're eager to do. It's not something we want to do, but we know it's something we ought to do if we want to be able to move on. 
and many still think of repentance that way. But an understanding of the gospel transforms our view of repentance. Keller writes about the difference between religious repentance, which is kind of what I've been describing now, and gospel repentance. In religion, the purpose of repentance is basically to keep God happy so he'll continue to bless you and answer your prayers. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to keep him happy. It's very much a pagan notion of who God is and what he's like. This means that religious repentance is selfish, it's self-righteous, and as he says, it's bitter all the way to the bottom. In the gospel, however, the purpose of repentance is to repeatedly tap into the joy of our union with Christ, which actually weakens our impulse to do anything that's contrary to God's heart. This kind of repentance actually brings about a transformation from the inside out. And that's a pretty big difference. So let's look more closely at his idea of religious repentance. He says, religious repentance is selfish. In religion, you're only sorry for sin because of its consequences for you. You know how it is as parents. Your child says they're sorry, but you're pretty sure the only thing they're sorry for is they got caught, right? Well, those kids grow up and they turn into us, and we go on with that same way of being. Sin will bring us punishment. We want to avoid that, so we repent. But that's not why we repent if we believe the gospel. Now, listen to this. This is key. See, it's not fear of punishment or judgment that leads us to repent. The gospel tells us that as Christians, sin can't ultimately bring us into condemnation. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. So what motivates our repentance if it's not fear of punishment or condemnation? If that's true, if the Bible's true, then what motivates us to turn from sin? The answer is the heinousness of sin itself. We hate it and we want to forsake it because it displeases and dishonors the God whom we love because He's the one who's freed us from the condemnation for that very sin. Thus, Keller concludes, in religion, repentance is self-centered. It's about protecting myself. But the gospel makes it God-centered. It's about His honor and His glory. In religion, we're mainly sorry for the consequences of sin, but in the gospel, we're sorry for the sin itself because it displeases the God we love. The second point Keller makes about repentance is that religious repentance is self-righteous. Repentance can easily turn into an attempt to atone for our sin, a form of self-flagellation, a word that comes from when people actually used to beat themselves for their sin. So, by our beating of ourselves, whether with literal whips or the other kinds of ways and devices we've come up with in order to do that, we think we can convince God and ourselves that we're so truly miserable and so truly regretful that we deserve to be forgiven. Again, if you're familiar at all with Martin Luther's life, he was constantly self-flagellating himself before God and before he understood the gospel. The belief was that you could somehow help pay for your sin through what you suffered and what you paid. And we have our own versions again of this today. But in the gospel, we know that Jesus suffered once for sin. We don't have to make ourselves suffer to merit God's forgiveness. We simply receive the forgiveness earned by Christ. Why does God forgive us? The Scripture says He forgives us because He is just. Well, that's a remarkable statement. But it would be unjust of God to ever deny us forgiveness because Jesus has paid for our sin and earned our acceptance. In religion, we try to earn our forgiveness with our repentance. In the gospel, we simply receive our forgiveness as a gift of grace that flows from the finished work of Christ. The third point Keller makes is that religious repentance is bitter all the way down. In religion, our only hope is to live a life good enough to require God to bless us. We're trusting in ourselves to be good enough for God, to be worthy of His blessing and favor, and consequently, every instance of sin... And repentance is traumatic, it's unnatural, and it's horribly threatening, as I talked about last week in the sermon. You see, namely, the acknowledgement of sin threatens our righteousness and our standing with God. 
Because we're believing it's by something that we're doing that we can stand before him and that we're accepted by him. And so to acknowledge sin, to acknowledge that I've fallen short, I can't do that. I'll, sh- I'll blame shift, I'll minimize, I'll defend myself, I'll attack you. I'll do all sorts of other things that own up to the fact that I'm a sinner because I'm hanging on to that fragile record of righteousness for my acceptance with God. Keller goes on to say in the gospel, the knowledge of our acceptance in Christ makes it easier to admit that we're flawed. We don't have to have a record of righteousness. We have one. It's not our own. It's Christ. And that gives us the freedom to acknowledge our sin, to own it, to take responsibility for it, because we're not afraid we're going to be cast off. Our hope is in Christ's righteousness, not our own. So it's not traumatic or not as traumatic to admit our sins and lapses. And here's where the contrast is most clearly seen. Whereas in religion, we repent less and less often and become more and more self-righteous over time. The more we feel accepted and loved in the gospel, the more and more we'll be repenting. And the more and more we'll be growing in true holiness and godliness. Although there is some bitterness in any repentance, in the gospel there is a sweetness. This creates a radical new dynamic. For personal growth. The more we see of our own sins and flaws, the more we turn to Christ and rejoice in the precious, electrifying, amazing grace that comes to us through the cross. Our love for God grows as we repent more and more deeply because our our recognition of what Christ has accomplished through the cross becomes bigger and bigger in our vision. At the same time, Keller says, the more aware we are of God's grace and our acceptance in Christ, the more we're able to drop our denials and self-defenses and admit the dimensions of our sin. Through confession, owning and taking responsibility for our sin, without minimizing, blame shifting, or anything else, we come into a deeper joy in Christ and His salvation. So, if you clearly understand these two different ways to go about repentance, then and only then can you profit from a regular practice of self-examination. Self-examination without understanding the gospel is a miserable and awful exercise, and you can read Martin Luther's biography if you want to see what that looks like. But if you understand the gospel, Keller lays out a model for how we can uh, incorporate regular self-examination in a way that actually leads to real repentance and deep joy in Christ. And so what I want to do is ask you a series of questions and show you how these are kinds of questions you might ask yourself in, uh, in, a, in a time alone with the Lord, and then how you can begin to apply the gospel in these particular areas so that you come away not only free but joyful in Christ. So one set of questions he asks has to do with humility and pride. And these are the questions. So let me ask you, you know, I invite you just to reflect on these as I ask them to you. Have you looked down on anyone? Have you been too stung by criticism you've received? Have you felt snubbed or ignored? Then he offers a suggestion of how you might go about repenting. He says, consider the free grace of Jesus until you sense a decreasing disdain for those you've been looking down upon, recognizing that you too are a sinner saved by grace. How can you look down on anyone when you're honest about your own heart? And only in the presence of Jesus will you truly, can you truly get honest about your own heart. And continue considering the free grace of Jesus until you have decreasing pain over the criticism you've received. Since you should not value human approval over God's love that's offered to you in Christ. And you already possess that love, that acceptance, that approval from Him. In light of His grace, we can let go of the need to keep up a good image. It's too great a burden to bear, and it's unnecessary. So we reflect on free grace until we experience grateful, restful joy. And where we can look horizontally at every other person rather than looking down at anyone. Another set of questions revolves around courage and anxiety. Have you avoided people or tasks that you know you should face? Have you been anxious and worried? Have you been rash or impulsive 
If so, then you can repent like this. Consider the free grace of Jesus until there's no cowardly avoidance of hard things since you know that Jesus faced evil for you. Consider that if he is for you, who and what can ever stand against you? Consider that nothing can separate you from his love. What have you to fear? Consider the free grace of Jesus until your anxieties are melted away since Jesus' death for you proves that God cares for you and he will watch over you. Recognize that you're not wise enough to be anxious about your life. For what do you really know about what's good for you and what isn't? Third set of questions relates to our love of others. Have I spoken or thought unkindly of anyone? Are you justifying yourself and your actions by caricaturing someone in your mind? Have you been impatient and irritable? Have you been self-absorbed, indifferent, or insensitive to others? Then consider the free grace of Jesus until there's no more coldness or unkindness in your heart as you think of his sacrificial love for you how deeply he loved you, how far he loved you. Consider his free grace until your impatience goes away as you consider the endless levels of patience he's exhibited toward you as you have slowly made your way toward him. Consider his free grace until your indifference is gone, knowing God is infinitely attentive to you. Finally, motivation. Are you doing what you do for God's glory and the good of others? Or are you being driven by fear? by the need for approval, by the love of comfort or ease, by a need for control, by hunger for praise or power, or the fear of other people? Are you looking at anyone with envy? Are you giving in even to the first motions of lust or gluttony? Are you spending your time on urgent things rather than important things because of any of these inordinate desires? Then repent like this. Consider the free grace of Jesus provides you with everything you're looking for in all of these other things. Consider how Jesus offers you something better than anything else these other things are driving you for. Another little booklet helps us see what true repentance looks like. It's sort of a summary here. Biblical repentance is oriented toward God, not toward me. The psalmist says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Secondly, biblical repentance is motivated by true godly sorrow, not just selfish regret, the fear of punishment. Thirdly, true biblical repentance is concerned with the heart and not just the external actions. Again, the psalmist prays, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then fourthly, biblical repentance looks to Jesus for deliverance from the penalty of sin, from the guilt of sin, and from the power of sin. It's all found in Jesus. If we're religious but don't grasp the gospel, then when we sin, we'll excuse it. We'll begin a pattern of remorse and resolution. You know what that's like. I feel really bad. I feel really bad, and I resolve I'm never going to do that again. Instead, a gospel-centered repentance is another two R's. I love how they do this in the little booklet. Instead of remorse and resolution, we want to realize and repent. Realize, I really did do that. I really am the kind of person who would do that. That really reflects something about the true condition of my heart. Realize, own it, and then repent. Lord, forgive me. You're my only hope. As we learn to live in light of the gospel, this kind of true repentance actually becomes more and more normal for us. We will eventually stop being surprised by our sin, which frees us to more honestly admit it when it happens. We're not surprised when somebody confronts us and tells us we've done something sinful because we've increasingly come to recognize ourselves as, in fact, a sinner. And we'll stop believing we can fix ourselves so that we'll more quickly run to Jesus for forgiveness and the transformation that we're so eager for. And the reality is, while you become increasingly aware that you're a sinner, in fact, to others, you will actually become increasingly a godly, holy, Christ-like person.
Martin Luther and the other formers helped us understand that the Bible teaches us that sin is a condition, not just a behavior. And if that's true, then repentance must be a lifestyle and not just an occasional practice when we're feeling really guilty. Finally, repentance is not something we avoid because we fear owning our sin will put us out of God's favor, but rather repentance is something we delight to do because we're increasingly honest about ourselves, our joy in Christ, and what He's accomplished for us grows and grows. So today, I thank God for Jesus Christ who paid my debt fully, the penalty of sin and the punishment for sin He took in His own body on the tree. He set me free from condemnation. And I thank God for Martin Luther and others who pointed us back to the Word during the Reformation and rescued the biblical gospel and consequently the joy of a gospel-centered repentance. With that, let me pray and let's stand and sing our closing song. Is the choir coming back up? All right, choir, come on up. Lord God, we thank you for the Scriptures and the invitation to repent and believe the gospel. I pray that our joy in that gospel would deepen and deepen and deepen, even as we see more truly and, and uh, clearly our own sinful condition. But may we not fear to own it, but rather may we rest in the confidence that our Christ is a great Savior, that His blood atones for every sin, that all is taken away, that He's born it all, and there remains for us only the love of a Father. In this we rejoice. May that joy send us out far into the world to preach this gospel to others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.